Good evening in my mother's language. My name is Stephanie Kavanyana Kanyandakwe. I'm a Rwandese British composer, artist, and broadcaster. And today, very thankful to be your host. Thank you for joining us for another event in our Ears Wide Open series. Each of these conversations are designed to give you the chance to discover more about our music and to hear from the world-class artists, producers and composers working on the stage and behind the scenes here at the MSO. Thank you to the Ears Wide Open presenting partner, Tarawara Estate, for their support of these events. MSO will be presenting Ears Wide Open events throughout the year and you can either watch live on YouTube or join us here in the auditorium. Make sure you subscribe to the MSO YouTube channel to ensure you hear about our upcoming events. We also want to hear from you tonight, so please add your questions and your comments to the live chat on YouTube and for our fantastic in-house audience, we'll have some roving mics for you too. Hopefully we'll have a chance to hear your questions at the end. We gather here tonight on an area where people have gathered for thousands of years. The Iwaki Auditorium sits just behind the southern banks of the Birrarung, which you might know as Yarra River right here in Nam or Melbourne. We humbly offer our deepest respects to the traditional owners of this unceded land, the Bundurung people of the Kulin Nation. Our respects to their elders past, their elders of this present time, and to those strong young leaders who are emerging in the footsteps of their formidable ancestors. This has been a place of sharing, celebrating, mourning, and passing on knowledge through gatherings with music over millennia, and in our own way, we do so tonight as we dive deep into Wata, a gathering for Manukau performers, improvising soloists and orchestra. This is a powerful new collaboration between David Yipanini Wilfred and his brother, Daniel Nakaboy Wilfred, and MSO's 2021 composer in residence, Paul Grabowski. This work celebrates the ceremonial song cycles of the Wagaluk people of northeastern Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. And in the lead up to the inaugural gathering of Wata this Wednesday night with MSO, tonight we gather to explore the culture, country and music of Wata through conversation and a musical preview with the team who have created this phenomenal work. So let's meet them. Immediately to my right is the fantastic Aviva Endine, who's a composer, performance maker and clarinetist with the Australian Arts Orchestra. And then we have David Yipanini Wilfred, Jongai manager of Manakai, and Daniel Nakaboy Wilfred, songman of Northeast Arnhem Land. Paul Grabowski, pianist, composer, arranger, conductor and artist and Peter Knight, trumpeter, composer, sound artist, and artistic director of the Australian Arts Orchestra. What a team, let's make them welcome. <laughs> Wata is a musical gathering, and it works with Manakai. So to Daniel and David, starting off our conversation, <coughs> what are Manakai? Manukai is a big song plan. Manukai, we sing about country and telling story. Manukai is an important us, so we have to keep it alive. So today, here yeah, I'm sharing with the new generation. So I'm keeping the song alive. And I love to share around, all around Australia. I share to the white people, orchestra, and I share when I get home. I share the Manikai. Manikai is mean us. Old song, big song. Manikai, that's we song. Manikai just come from the didgeridoo and from the clapping stick. And now we wanted to pass it 
who can keep life the song, the next generation. And I'm still sharing. My good friends here, friend there, funny guy telling story. The How water. does Vanakai get used when you're up on country in Arnhem Land? When would you, when would you perform a Manakai? When I perform in, back in my country, you see five songs of five people there singing the Manakai, singing the one song. And you see, Two didgeridoo or five didgeridoo player waiting who can blow the didgeridoo. And what types of events would you play a manakai at? Is it connected to ceremonies? It's connected to ceremony and we run the funeral, we run the smoking ceremony, someone graduate, we run Manikai, you know, that's what Manikai is. Paul, tell us about your journey to the Northern Territory. How did you first connect with Manikai and these songmen? Well, I'm a very curious person and um, I've always um, been intrigued by all sorts of music and, and the opportunity to find ways of collaborating with musicians from different cultures. Using the idea of improvisation, I guess, as, as a starting point um, and seeing if we can make something together. <coughs> and I'd done a lot of different work um, with, with people from Bali and from India, from the United States. European artists and, and so on, and of course a lot of people in Australia, but for many years uh, I had really never had the opportunity to uh, discover the great treasures of our First Nations traditional music. Um, I started to work with First Nations artists uh, about 20 years ago when I began working with um, Uncle Archie Roach and the late Ruby Hunter. Um, but a friend of mine uh, had a connection to the community in Luka and I asked him uh, where would be a good place to go to meet master musicians who were custodians of traditional material and he offered to take me to Nuka. and. Pretty much from the very first day that I arrived there, which was in 2004, I met members of the Wilfred clan and they were very enthusiastic about the idea of sharing Manike. Um, because as Daniel just said, Manike is a living tradition. It's not something which, you know, has, was created at some point in, in the distant past and, and just repeats itself over and over again. Manike is a very living, very organic and um, very reactive kind of art form which responds to the world in real time. I mean, it does a whole lot of things at once in a, in a way. It, 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 summons up ancestor figures and it tells ancient stories. And the stories really talk about the interconnectedness of all things. So there's a way of looking at Manike that they are kind of models of the universe or they are something which dissolve our concept of space-time. They open up a well of well, I guess a, a sort of force which is coming out of the distant past. But at the same time, as, as Daniel just said, they can celebrate a graduation or a football game. Um, Manike can be and are suitable for all things. So, um, you know, when I arrived, I, 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 be <laughs> I began 
a long journey of discovery and, and really uh, I owe it to these people that they have had the patience and generosity to bring us to the point where we are now where Manike is coming into the mainstream of the uh, Australian cultural experience which is exactly where it should be because I mean it is one of the world's great cultural treasures really. Mm, absolutely. David, you have a particularly special role as a Jungai, if I'm saying that correctly, you manage Manakai? Yeah. yeah. So how do you manage Manakai then when you're working with someone like Paul and, and that music? Yeah, I, I joined myself with my deed, play my deed with the Melbourne Orchestra, mm -hmm. with Paul and Peter. And then we play in Nuka. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of, and we play in Germany and Hong Kong, China. We went with Paul, Peter. You travel quite a lot. Yeah, together. travel. Yeah, travel a lot mm. yeah, in Melbourne, and sometimes we go. When Peter come there and Paul, we used to take her out, and go fishing, and then we have a like little bit of concert, playing uh, playing Madich, mm. and they play the music, and they follow us, follow Madich too, mm. on a play Madich. Mm. Yeah. Do, how do you choose? which Manakai to perform or to share? I used to share with my kids water and Dwarpara, walking, mm. yeah, and then many songs I, I share my kids. Yeah, with sugar bake, tahani. Mm. Yeah, it's quite call. a generous way yeah. of, of sharing music between each other to also incorporate travel and fishing trips. Yeah, 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 travel, so That yeah. kind of relationship yeah, building. Yeah, relation, yeah. Mm. The, you just mentioned jewel putter, and I realised that in Wata, this gathering, uh, it yeah. centres around yeah, that... Gathering your family. Mm. Then when we have the smoking ceremony at Nuka, mm. at home, we we'll we'll gather the family, and then we have the ceremony, smoking ceremony. Mm. Yeah, when we have the funeral, all that, you know, back home in Nuka. Can you go through a little bit of the story of Jawpada and how it, it yeah. works in Wata? Jawpada is probably come from Daniel Place. Yeah. My mother country, mm -hmm. yeah. Bilibigi, home. Used to travel from, you travel everywhere, and used to travel in Gope, uh, every places, mm. give them song every place. Yeah. Is Jewel Potter a creation story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got story here, yeah. Jewel Potter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Joining you on stage, there's quite a cluster of soloists and members of the Australian Art Orchestra, including their artistic director and trumpeter, Peter Knight, and associate artist, Aviva Endeen, on clarinets, plural, as I noted yeah. in yesterday's rehearsal, um, and also some kind of rubber-like instrument, which was new to my eyes. Um, Aviva, I wanted to ask you about the differences for you as uh, an improvised soloist in front of orchestra with this gathering work like Wata, what's the difference between doing that, say, versus a Mozart clarinet concerto? Well, I've never had the joy of playing Mozart clarinet concerto with an orchestra, but um, I mean, yeah, this is an extraordinary opportunity for me because I guess I did come from that classical tradition and have played and in orchestras and enjoyed that sound world. Um, before, so it's something I'm quite familiar with, but have had some time away from. So it's, um, yeah, it was an absolute joy to sit in a room with such incredible sounds and musicians today. Um, and it feels really nice as well to be able to bring to it, you know, these relationships that we've been developing together um, and that I feel like 
the newest generation too, you know, with Paul, Paul beginning this relationship and then Peter and then being invited into what's already such a, you know, beautiful musical and musical connection as well as friendships and mm. relationships. Um, so I felt like what we kind of brought with our instrumental practice um, is perhaps, yeah, that kind of familiarity and this, this um, ability that the Australian art orchestra musicians have as improvisers to kind of bridge those worlds between, um, you know, the amazingly notated score that Paul's created um, and that the MSO musicians are so skilled at executing. Um, and then are familiar, you know, I'm sort of becoming more and more familiar every time with the Manakai and with those songs and with the stories, as well as with the, the music, the phrasing, the rhythms. Um, and then so as an improviser, I feel like uh, we get to kind of be this bridge between those two worlds. And that's kind of how I felt today when we were rehearsing. Um, somehow, you know, bringing our instruments, my instrument, bass clarinet from the Western classical tradition, um, but having had the experience of playing in these other contexts as well. Mm. And what is it that you play in addition to bass clarinet as well that adds that really kind of bendable but soulful voice sound? Uh, well, I sometimes am singing while playing or diff doing various yeah, techniques on the instrument, but do you mean the pipe? Yeah. Yeah. And um, the. I have no word for it. You have to <laughs> that's fine. let us know what it is. <laughs> um, Stephanie's referring to an instrument that I brought out at the beginning to kind of evoke this scene setting, um, sunrise, dawn kind of quality of the beginning of the piece. Um, and it's an instrument called the Unchingu that I actually learnt about from a South African friend um, on a residency in New York and she shared that with me and it is literally just a piece of pipe. So you play it like an overtone flute. Mm. Yeah, but it's just a piece of plastic. <laughs> to be honest, dare I say, it might be sacrilegious. It's as beautiful as the clarinet. <laughs> when you play it, it really does create a really interesting sound and sequence. Um, we are super lucky to be present for a world first, a world premiere hearing of an excerpt from Wata, and that will be with Daniel and David and Paul. If I can invite you to take your places now over towards your instruments. Whilst you get ready, just a reminder for everyone here and at home that MSO is going to be presenting Ears Wide Open events throughout this year and you can watch either live on YouTube or join us as you are with this wonderful audience in the studio. So just make sure you subscribe to the MSO YouTube channel to make sure that you've got some alerts in your calendar to tell you when more great events are coming up. Now that the three of you have settled, do you want to talk us through what we're about to hear? What excerpt are you playing now? Yeah. You're hearing about new song about Ireland, Lutunbai. Mm. We're sitting there making a pushback. That's a new song. It's come up for, from Dream. You know, I was sitting, making a push the little bit. So, this is a new song. It's a place called Luttenbai, Ireland. There you go, Paul. Okay.
Oh, thank you. present for an excerpt from Water with Daniel and David and Paul performing there as uh, Daniel was saying a new song as well it's super super exciting now we also want to hear from you tonight so just a reminder please add your questions and comments to the live chat on YouTube and hopefully we have the chance to read some of those out at the end and to our spectacular audience here tonight as well get your thinking caps on the questions that you might have as we continue Peter you have worked with Daniel and David and other members of the family up in Nucker with the Australian Art Orchestra for quite some time. I wanted to put to you a thought around building relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous groups. Yeah, well, I, I've been involved uh, for just over eight years now. And um, Paul is the founding artistic director of the, uh, of the Australian Art Orchestra. So this, this piece, Wata, is, is the coming together of a, a kind of a number of different threads and it's a really lovely thing to be to be involved in that with Paul and with David and Daniel and Paul and David and Daniel started um, you know this relationship which has gone on to and 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 other uh, older generations in Nooka as well um, and uh, and those relationships have um, formed associations and spread out through the music community in Australia um, and internationally in really extraordinary ways. Um, we, we, we go down to Tasmania each year for around two weeks and we uh, run a residency called the Creative Music Intensive. And um, at, at that residency, which is in the Southern Highlands, an, an incredible place called Taralia, um, we come together and we, we follow that, that notion that you know is that has been the driving um, kind of intention of the art orchestra from the beginning of using improvisation as a way of a, 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 as, as a starting point for developing not just musical relationships but just friendships and uh, and we spend two weeks um, with David and Daniel they, they um, are, are co-leaders of the intensive and we have musicians now coming from all over the world to uh, work with them, to, we have um, a master musician who comes each year from Korea as well, um, and uh, it's a really amazing time. And when you know you ask that question, that's immediately where my mind goes. And Aviva's um, been involved in that too. And uh, yeah, so um, music is a powerful uh, kind of way to develop relationships and build community. Um, I think we probably try to go from the intention of creating the friendships and seeing what music comes from the friendships and um, and yeah it's really it's it's a really moving and inspiring thing to be part of yeah it's a real honor to be to be here with these gentlemen and uh, to be playing music and Paul from your perspective as a composer how do you see these relationships building and informing each other? Well, um, as I said before, uh, you know, Manakai is an interesting proposition um, and runs very counter to a lot of the um, things we expect in Western civilization about what constitutes a piece of music. Uh, we think of a piece of music as being like an object which has a beginning and, and an end and outside of which that piece of music essentially doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, we've invented a kind of notational system for enshrining that proposition. But in Manike, as as I was saying earlier, really what is being proposed is using music as a way of expressing the world 
and everything that goes into the world. Manike is a part of life, or in another way, it is life itself. And there isn't a sense that it's a separate activity that you would do a, apart from, you know, playing football or getting up in, in the morning and having breakfast. I mean, Manike somehow really brings all of those things together in a kind of a music, what we would describe as a musical utterance. But the form of Manike in its homeland is something that, again, is very unlike and contrary to our expectations about what a piece of music is supposed to do. In Manike, things happen seemingly without warning and they are very intense, normally accompanied by dancing of a particular kind, and they're very short. And that they're then followed by a long period of something that I call absence, which is a time period in which that, act, that musical activity is not happening. But that absence is as important and as vital to the manike as the actual singing of the words and the playing of the didge and the clapping of the bilma. Um, so in bringing that into a kind of a dialogue with an orchestral uh, paradigm, it's, you know, it's a challenge. But the great thing is that uh, Manike embraces, Manike is, is a universe which embraces everything. So there's no sense that you're invading the space with an orchestral piece of music. The orchestral music is inspired by and at the service of the whole idea of Manike. And the fact that we have improvising musicians who are working as a kind of a thread that joins together the various pieces of through composed instrumental orchestral music means that we're creating an environment. It's something which, yes, in a sense, it has a beginning and an end, but it could just as well not have either of those things. The way that I imagine this piece of music, you could walk into the middle of it and still be sitting in the auditorium the following day, long after the orchestra have all gone home, and the manike would still be mm. at work. It is something which you're part of. You are it. It is you. And this is where we've kind of, you know, as Australians, we have uh, missed a great opportunity somewhere early in our post-colonial development to have a radically different society than the one that we've arrived at. If we had been more alive to the notion that there is an open-ended way of coexisting which is not based on land ownership and the acquiring of wealth and, and things which happen at the expense of environments in which we live, we'd probably be the happiest and, and most uh, progressive nation on earth. All of that, to me, is inherent and suggested by Manike. Mm. And, you know, I've played a lot of different music in my life. Classical music, jazz music, you know, various... Well, I've had the great opportunity to work with some of the greatest uh, popular musicians in the country. But what this music has taught me is that, and as, as Uncle Archie Roach says, you know, there is one song, actually. Mm. One song. And everything, Beethoven, Bach, the lot of it, you know, the great Indian classical musicians, the Balinese musicians, the great African musicians, they're all part of the one song. Mm. Touching on what you were talking about around 
sharing and Manakai having this open-endedness and, and a connection that um, has different senses of time, where it starts and where it finishes compared to Western classical music. And indeed, it sounds like Western classical music has a lot to learn from, from Manakai with, with its progression. How do you then try and fit your orchestrations to work with Manakai so that there is that balance sense between you? And what's, what's that challenge like as a composer? <laughs> well, as a composer, you always want to try and write music um, which, which people are going to want to play. <laughs> I mean, I think composers um, really are there to work together with musicians to create something together. Again, I, I really do believe that the act of writing music suggests a collaboration with people. Um, if I was just to kind of write something in with, with, without reference to the people that I was writing for and just deliver a score and say, just, you know, play that, there's no guarantee that anybody's going to particularly enjoy that um, because it, maybe I hadn't really thought about who I was writing for. But because I know these people and I know that what they're going to bring to the gathering is very personal to them and uh, allows them the opportunity to really feel free to express and to contribute to the work. So similarly, I try and write music for the orchestral musicians that I believe will uh, bring out what they are best at, which is that they are all, uh, you know, incredibly skilled players of their instruments. They, you know, they make a beautiful sound. Uh, they're proud of the sound they make. They love working as an ensemble. They love the idea of creating a beautiful ensemble sound. You've really got to work with those things. You've got, you've got to seize that opportunity. And for me, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I've, I grew up listening to orchestral music. It's something that I really love. It's in my blood. It's in, it's in my heritage, uh, in my ancestry. And, um, you know, that's, that's my ancestors talking through me to these people's ancestors. And again, I come back to the one song concept. At some point, my ancestors and their ancestors were hanging out, you know. And uh, they continue with to with this music. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what this is about, really. It's, it's a coming together. It's a bungle. It's a ceremony. It's a celebration that we are one people. Daniel and David, what is it like for you to hear your Manakai reflected with an orchestra and, and the orchestra sound? Um, be nice. I like to be nice on the, <laughs> to the orchestra and orchestra, I always listen what's good there to play on, to try put the money guy, trying to make something there with the orchestra. Manikai telling orchestra, come on, not standing there. We have to do, we have to do it. Because I said, nothing there behind for me. Something there waiting. Manikai make people gather up. Make, if you gather up and playing the manikai, putting manikai on the orchestra, we're doing something. We're doing bungo. We're doing manikai. Okay. Orchestra, like, it's really like they're with good people and when I stand up and I see something touching me, 
but I'm singing Manikai Bungul from my heart. And I like to share a lot and play with the orchestra and part of my friend, you know. We gather up together. I do that in the orchestra. When I go home, something same. We gather up and we meet up and we form. Same, you know. Come to the orchestra. I saw the same thing, what I do at home. Manika is it's really old now, Manika. But it's happy. I have to tell a little story it's at this happy. point. And it's, you know, when I first went to Nuka, and I knew nothing about Manika. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I remember meeting the old man, grandfather. Mm. And, uh, well, actually, I didn't really meet him, but, you know, I knew that he was the man who was responsible for, he was the, the, the owner of this particular song cycle of Jumulpura. Mm -hmm. And he was the great visual artist, uh, Jambu Burabura, you know, whose you know, work is, is incredible and in all the major collections. Mm. And that's another thing about Nuka. Nuka is a major centre of visual art as well. Um, <laughs> and I said to, to Benjamin Wilfred, um, you know, I really want to learn about this music. Teach me about this music. And he said, you know, well, I've heard this before. Teach me this music. But, you know, people, they come in here... They say, oh, we're going to do something with you, we're going to make something with you. And then they leave the community, because these communities are not easy to get to. And, you know, we never see them again. Mm. So, you know, you can say what you like, and you can probably even mean it. But unless you really come back and come back and come back, then it's not going to happen. Mm. So after that first visit, you know, I knew that the challenge had been thrown. And... Uh, I did, I came back, and I actually came back with the art orchestra, with, with about 15 people, including with Archie and Ruby. So we were on tour, and we, we went to Nuka. And during that time, we spent about five or six days there, and, you know, we all sat down, and we were given lessons in Manakai. We were taught these songs. And one day, Jambu Bura Bura, turned up. And I could see that everybody, you know, the, the Benjamin and, and everybody were going, oh, he's here. Jambu is here. And he was, he was there for a while, just listening, and then he disappeared. Didn't see him again. And then at the end of that time, we did the concert with Archie and Ruby. And before the concert, Benjamin said, we have to play what we have learned. We have to play the Manakei first before we do the concert with Archie and Ruby. Well, of course, we all felt totally ill-equipped and, you know, babes... Great test. You know, really th th being thrown under the bus here and... Um, but, OK, we had, we had to do it. It wasn't like, would you like to? It was, a, you know, a demand. You must do this. This is out of respect to this community. You have to show that You've learned something while you've been here. So we got up and we played. And, you know, the fact that I hadn't seen the, the grandfather since that day, I was really concerned that he'd kind of looked at it and gone, no way, you know, these people aren't serious. And um, we were playing and I, I looked up from my keyboard and he was on stage singing. And I realised uh, that that was clearly him saying, "This is it's all good. And I tell you, it's been amazing. The journey since that, that day of what we've experienced together, where we've been, the audiences we've played to, from Parliament House in Canberra to, you know, to the uh, Quai d'Orsay Museum in Paris to, 
uh, London Jazz Festival to you know Germany and the various things that have happened with, with uh, under Peter's leadership too, with you know the, the cross cultural meetings with uh, Korean musicians and it's just you know rolled and rolled and rolled. The story of this manike has is, is self evident that it is a thing which simply expands like a natural organic process and takes everything on board, takes it to its heart. And if you're lucky enough to be able to be on that journey, then you're never not on that journey. It's just part of your life. Well, I've got a question for both you, Paul, and also Peter, given your long running collaboration and your continuing relationships with, with the community in Naka and with Daniel and David. You've talked a lot about what you've gained in terms of learning these manukai quite directly and, and working together to create music together. Can you talk us through a sense of what you have given back? Is there an exchange process where you teach your song to, to people in the community and, and how do you find ways to make it an equal exchange? Peter? Hmm. Um, we had a great experience in 2019, Aviva and myself and a few other musicians from the art orchestra went to Nooka and um, Daniel was away and so we spent time with David and um, it, it changed things because normally the Manakeh is performed with voice and dig. And because Daniel wasn't around and we were spending a lot of time with David, we spent a lot of time just improvising. And remember, David, when we talked about, remember that night we were playing and we said, we're going to follow, try and follow the music? So rather than do the songs, rather than do the, the, yeah. the, the old songs, we'd just make up something and follow the music. Yeah. And that was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. And then we went and we came back to Melbourne eventually and we did the performance at the Make It Up Club and we, so we've got this thing called following the music now. And I mean, if even might, might want to say something about it too, it was, yeah. it was a fun time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was this extraordinary evening where we were sitting up uh, near where we were staying outside with this beautiful sunset and the, the mountains behind us. You were playing with that. And we oh, had, you played yeah. clarinet too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we were swapping, yeah. swapping uh, bits of our <laughs> instruments and we shared a meal and together. My yeah. Yeah. And then you. Uh, Peter played with saxophone, right? Trumpet? Trumpet, and Trumpet yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, I, I mean, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's giving back. I guess it is, it's, a, it's definitely a, a, an exchange. It's a different kind of exchange because often when we're, when we're working together, David and Daniel are leading and, and are sharing the songs and um, that's an incredible thing and incredible generosity, um, but without... Daniel there, it was different. And now you've sort of started to, with Sonny, also develop some different things. So we work with this incredible singer, Sonny Kim, who's from uh, Seoul and who lives in here in Melbourne now. And Daniel and Sonny have developed this incredible musical uh, relationship and, um, and have been um, working on new songs together, haven't you? And also the song we played just now mm. is a new song mm. that, uh, that Daniel and David introduced as a response to what they heard because I'd, I'd played them uh, the score that I'd written for Lata. And, um, you know, we haven't really talked much about the, what that's about, but in, in Wata which takes place over a, a 24 hour cycle. So, well, it basically opens at sunrise, it's not 24 hours. It opens at sunrise and it ends at sunset. And during that time, Jawulpara is, you know, creating and wa walking around, but he's also needing to hunt. So he's making a spear and a spear thrower. And, and he's getting further and further away from his country and at one point, he has to make this dilly bag, but it's a new song. It's an, and the meaning of it is something which 
will have some very, very great significance, I know. I'm not sure yet what that significance is because always these songs mean something far, far greater than a simple explanation can tell you. But it will be something to do with law and something to do with special country and special place. And at that point, he feels that he's gone as far away from home as he can go. And it's time to go back. So that point of, you know, of, of, of journey and then return, I think is a, that, that seems to be what they have discovered that, that this piece is about. And it's a learning that I have been able to, been lucky enough to hear. I didn't realise that that's what I had written. But now I absolutely realise that that's, that is totally what I've written. They are way ahead of me about what I've done. It's like, yeah, of course, now I get it. I wrote it, but now I get it. You know. mm. yeah. Aviva, I wanted to bring you into the conversation around action and activity. You're a creator who's worked across so many different projects and been a, a great collaborator with a lot of people. Art that works to celebrate, present and preserve languages, we know, is such a vital action. And art in many spaces has held a role in the past in activism. From your perspective as a musician and as a collaborator, is there a role for activism of a kind with classical music and these kinds of collaborations? Yeah, um, it's a big question. Um, and I think, what, yeah, I think what we do together as musicians, I mean, I think there's a lot to be learnt from being together, spending time together and learning from each other through that. And every time we, we have this kind of meeting in this project or other projects, you know, we are learning from each other um, and listening. And I think through that, that is a sort of form of action. Um, and that's a form of activism, you know, just kind of staying open to what other people in your life bring. And then the fact that we're able to do this together, we're, you know, making art, making music, it's a very generative thing. And I think um, new understandings are always being brought to the fore through doing that. Um, so I feel like I've been very lucky to sort of be able to be engaged in these processes and these collaborations where uh, you feel like through the way that we're making the relationships or the way that we're engaging in the project, we are able to kind of bring to that whatever our ethical standpoint is or, you know, make positive relationships and through that make positive change. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, feel like I should open it up to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, music is, is about, it's, it's relational. Mm. You know, we get very hung up in Western musical education on fixed entities like pitch, you know, rhythm, harmony. But actually what is really important in music is the relationship between things. That's what music is actually really about. And when you like a piece by, let's say, Beethoven, for example, what you really like is the relationship between all the different elements in it. You may not know what they are, but you like the way they work together. Mm. And I think that that word relationship and listening is two very important words that came out of what yeah. you just said. Mm. Really, really critical words and unfortunately not words which are respected enough I think. Yeah I think there is something special as well about music um, as a form. I mean I have a great love of music obviously as a musician but it feels like a wonderful form to be working in because it both so it has this amazing ability to be sort of instantaneous. When I get in a room with any of these people, we can automatically play music. Mm -hmm. We don't need um, any kind of 
pre rehearsal and of course something else can happen if that happens, but as improvisers, we can just play together. Um, and that feels like an extraordinary thing about music. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's something really special about the time it takes to, to pay attention, to listen. You can't fast track that. You can't absorb everything in one instant and that it kind of requires that, that attentiveness and that time of, of the listener. Um, I think is a powerful thing, that we have to take the time to be together to listen. And the patience to listen and listen again, I think is one of the lessons I learnt when I was studying composition. And in the backdrop, going home to Rwanda and, and learning the traditional songs of my people and coming from a clan that's a storytelling clan and a, a song-holding clan. Um, and there was one that annoyed me. <laughs> And I was always annoyed that there was something traditional from my background that was just sitting in my ear in a certain way. I found myself feeling uncomfortable in my chair when I was listening to this one song. And I asked one of our elders, you know, what is it? It's, sadly, I don't have our language. But I have a kind of ear for the feeling of it, if that makes sense. And this elder gave me a challenge and just said, well, you have to go and listen to that song until you understand it and, and listen deep. And I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to try. But it, it just, you know when you hear something that it bugs you. And at the end of listening to it, on repeat for weeks upon weeks, finally I, I turned around and I said, I think there's a question here about our ancestral totem, which is Sakabaka. It's a, a black kite, a really big bird. And I went back to, to the elder and I said, you know, is it that? Um, and if that, was, that was the case. And, and the elder said, to be honest, whatever you tell me you think it is, it is. <laughs> but the point is, you just had to really go through that and listen until you were comfortable and you found that question for yourself. I, I think it feels like with this music that you're creating mm. together, there is that patience required to really go into an understanding of the story that's being shared and how you relate as an individual to that story. There's, there's a really, I, I just wanted to ask Daniel a question actually. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the Raki? I think that right. it's really important. I find that, the, that when you talk about the Raki is really inspiring and it's really relevant, I think. Yes, the Raki, you get, Someone name in there, so I have to. In my older brother, the Rocky is there, but he's got the name. But I don't allow, allow to use it. I have to wait from the Jungai and the Ola to let me know. All right, you can use it. The Rocky, you can use it. The song, because right now, I'm not using it. I think it's closed down. Rocky is a same thing for the Jewel Parai. Used to walk with that Rocky mm. and used to go and hunt and fish. So Jewel Parai, we have to go across. We're not going to use the Rocky. We have to use the dilly bag. Mm -hmm. The Rocky is like a string, isn't it? Rocky is like a long string. Yeah. Pull it. Pull everybody, Rocky. Rocky is mean home, family, pass away. We use that, the Rocky. Rocky yeah, is mean someone drink, but away. he still got that bungul. He got on the manikai, on the bungul. And I, I was speak, speaking to Daniel before the last time we had our, our residency. And um, we were speaking on the phone, and he said, the Rocky is pulling all of us together. Yeah. Even for the people who we didn't know, they were coming. And we yeah. Were... That's <laughs> one come from there. One come from there. That's Rocky. That's a, Rocky is a bungal about Manikai. But we're not going to... Me, Mawawa, today, and Viva, David... We're not going to use it till I get a permission 
from the elders at home. Tell me, all right, you're free to use it, and then I can use it. But we have the new song with the dilly bag. That's a new song from the dilly bag coming, mm. because we're clucking. Bush honey, fish, mm. we're clucking bush, potato, yeah. we're clucking that. Well, yeah. the new, new song and, and my other places. That's a new song from, it's come up from the, the island. From the island. Yeah. Yeah. We make that new song. Now, I feel like through our conversation here and, of course, the <coughs> premiere coming up on mm. uh, Wednesday, all of you have brought us together like that yeah. string mm. into... When we got up together, point. when we were on the stage, so I come often meet Peter or Paul. So when we on the stage playing with the orchestra, we like a brother and sister <laughs> in big stage. Well, sadly, we are fast running out of time, <laughs> but I do know that there are a lot of questions that have been coming through, both through YouTube with those of you at home, as well as from the audience. So let's take a couple of questions. And this is for everybody, so feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. From John Nolan, will any of what we hear in Wata be improvised by the orchestra? So not the soloist, but by MSO, the orchestra. And, and how do you improvise with a, a symphony orchestra? Oh, well, maybe I should answer that as yeah. I'm the culprit responsible for writing the, the orchestral score. Um, no, there's not really any... Well, there's, there's some um, areas of music where the rhythmic um, material can be improvised. But that's something which is quite common, I think, in a lot of recently written, and by recent I mean within the last sort of 50 or 60 years. Um, you know, you, you supply pitch material, you can say, play it in, you know, as, as quickly as you can but you don't actually notate each individual phrase. So to that extent, there's a bit of improvisation. There's also some open sections of repeated material which allow for uh, David and Daniel to, to create manakai, to, to sing, or um, we have something called lia, which is a kind of improvised sort of singing that, that Daniel does. Um, so, you know, I have to create avenues for that to be able to happen spontaneously. So the orchestra kind of sits on a particular thing for a while while that happens. Um, and then, you know, I, I indicate to, to Ben Norley, the conductor, when it's time to move on. But no, I mean, I'm not expecting the orchestral musicians to improvise. It's, it's not necessarily something that they all feel comfortable doing. And, as I said earlier, I mean, my main concern in writing for orchestra is to write something that they really want to play, that plays to their strengths. And I think that that's really important. I mean, everybody else had been given that opportunity, so the orchestra should be too. Before we take a question from the audience here, we've got another that's come through from YouTube. Will the community get to hear the performance? So the community in, in Naka up in the Northern Territory. And they ask, how does your community feel about Manakai being heard in this way on the other side of the country? Good. Manakai, yeah. like coming people home listening and they know what I'm doing, like yeah. to go share my knowledge to Manakai and the song, sharing, people know, mm -hmm. my family, mm. and my, my friends, old friends, in home, they know, because I know I'm going 
to share the manika and the water and the jewel para. And hopefully there's a sense of um, them getting to hear the work as well. Yeah, people Fix like it seeing it, Laura. What I done, lot of film, like often like video or coming to YouTube on orchestra page or mm -hmm. people watch it. They seen it. Sometimes they tell me, I know you're doing, and that's what I doing now. And to take back home and with my good feeling. Coming with my good feeling, mm. and I'm going back home with my good feeling. Yeah, you bring that energy. Yeah, I bring the energy, and they send me back with good mind, and good energy. Yeah, that's great. We got any questions from the audience with some roving mics? I think I saw it. Yeah. I've got a pretty big voice. Is that all right? <laughs> A mic coming to your hand right now. What I heard in that world first that we heard was such um, a supportive composition from Paul where he really let the, the Manakai speak and that was the feature piece. But I wonder how hard it is to ensure that that's how the compositions, the whole production is plays out and how you get around maybe people thinking this is just further colonisation of traditional music? <laughs> I was waiting for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you see, I, I don't buy into it uh, because, um, as I've explained, this whole process has been driven by me wanting to learn from them, not the other way around. I, I, I didn't rock into Nooka and say, boy, have I got something for you guys. You know, ever heard of jazz? You're going to love this stuff. <laughs> you know, um, they were interested to know what sort of music I made. And I, around that time, I had just recently made a recording in New York uh, with some, you know, famous American jazz musicians. And I said, look, here's an, here's an example of what I do. I made it in a city called New York in, in America. And Benjamin said, oh, I've been to New York. You know. <laughs> and he had, you know. I, I mean, never assume anything. Uh, that's, this is another one of the great things you learn as an artist, I think. Never assume anything. Never assume that you know how uh, an audience is going to respond to what you've written. And... You know, n never assume that because you are sitting at the feet of somebody who is a First Nations person that you are de facto, therefore, the coloniser. Because actually, you're just there as a fellow human in a situation like that. I, I, I wanted nothing but to learn. And I think that the success of this whole enterprise is that everybody who's part of it, including you now, um, are in exactly the same position. So I accept that we all suffer from a legacy of unbridled cruelty and, uh, caused by colonialisation in this country. And, you know, it's something that we all just have to kind of get real about. But it doesn't always have to be like that. And the path to reconciliation is by learning from one another, and especially for Ballander, white people, to listen to our First Nations people. We can only gain by that. We've got time for one more question. There's a hand up over here in the middle of the audience. Hi, I was um, wondering with a um, question for um, Daniel and David. Um, Paul has said that they went in there to learn from you, went to Nooka to learn from you. Um, and did you learn something from them? Okay. In your musical, in your musical, yeah. for your musical life? That's one question I've got two. 
We'll see how much we can get through. Paul, uh, Paul learn, learn about the song from us. Yeah. Yeah. When he came in Nuka. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the question is, did you learn anything from us? Yep. Yeah. Um, I learned about something because I was listening what Paul was playing and yeah. I told Paul I, I like to sound. Let's play something. Maybe <laughs> Paul telling me this is, you know, how to manage the manika and to learn. Yeah. Mix it up. I was like, up. what, listening, Wawa, Paul, Piera, like, that was really great, you know, like, to try put the manika on that. Yeah, it's really good. Music. I learn about. I learn from the orchestra. The other, the other question, sorry, was that you talked about liking to hear the sound of the orchestra, and was it difficult for you and David to put the put your way of thinking about music and the way you want to express your music? Was it difficult to put that with? this other music that came to you? Sometimes it take me for like listening and hours, maybe. We, we talk about uh, Manikai, we sit and talk. This is what we're gonna do. Sometimes I feel not comfortable and, but now, these guys, asking me to learn from them. And I'm asking this gentleman here today to learn my manikai. I think that's all we have time for, but on that beautiful note, it's a great place mm. to stop at this moment. A reminder that you can see what are on stage at Melbourne's Hamer Hall on Wednesday 31st and Thursday 1st of April, Wednesday and Thursday this week. Visit the MSO website for details. And a huge thank you to our ears wide open presenting partner Tarawara Estate and to Creative Victoria and the City of Melbourne for their support of tonight's event. A big thank you to this incredible panel, again in my mother's language, Murakoza Chane. Thank you so much to Aviva and Dean, David Yvonne Wilfred, Daniel Nukaboy Wilfred, Paul Grabowski, and Peter Knight. Thank you to our audience for joining us, and thank you at home as well. Let's give them a round of applause in our appreciation <laughs> for this beautiful conversation. Thank you everybody for joining us.